Hi everyone. Welcome back to my channel. In this video, we're going to take a closer look at mobster Nino Gaji. When Nino was young, he made money delivering flowers and used this income to fuel his gambling habits. It was during this time that he discovered the lucrative nature of loan sharking among gamblers. Gaji's family purchased a small farm and relocated to New Jersey when he was a young adolescent. When he reached the age of 17 in 1942, he made an attempt to serve in the American army but was turned down because of his nearsightedness. The family moved to Bath Beach, Brooklyn in 1943, where his mother and sister found employment at a clothing factory and his father continued his trade as a barber. In the meantime, Gaji's brother Roy began supplying bars with peanut dispensers after receiving a discharge from the army due to an accident. Gaji decided to get involved in criminal activity after arriving back in New York. Mobster Frank Scalise, a member of the Gambino crime family, helped Gaji get a job at a truck port where he soon advanced to the position of supervisor. Scalise was his father's cousin. In the end, Scalise permitted him to become a ghost employee, which meant he was not required to work but was still paid. Gaji had plenty of time, thanks to this agreement to loan shark at different Brooklyn places including clubs and pool halls. Additionally, by declaring genuine salary for taxation reasons as a no-show worker, he was able to escape any potential legal action for tax evasion. In 1947, Gaji's sister Marie gave birth to Dominic Montilio, whose father was the boxer and deliveryman Anthony Santa Maria. However, due to Gaji's dominating personality, Santa Maria became estranged from the family, and Gaji took on the role of a surrogate father to Dominic. As Dominic grew older, he became involved in criminal activities alongside his uncle and eventually ended up testifying about these activities in court. Gaji was charged with leading a global auto theft network and made his first arrest in 1954. Frank Scalise, who was now the head of the Gambino criminal family, supported the operation, which was based out of a used car dealership in Brooklyn. Gaji and two friends ran a plan over a two-year period in which they made fictitious registrations for Cadillacs that weren't actually there. The cars that matched the false characteristics were subsequently stolen, and fake vehicle identification numbers were put on them in their place. They also supplied new license plates for the stolen cars that matched the fake registrations. Then these automobiles were offered for sale in a number of states, including Florida, Georgia, Texas, and Mexico. While Gaji's auto theft trial was underway in 1955, he got married. Surprisingly, during the trial, witnesses conveniently forgot their testimonies on the witness stand, and his co-defendants refused to testify against him. In early 1956, Gaji was acquitted of the charges. Later that same year, he became a father, and his wife and child lived on the first floor of their three-story Gaji house. The Gambino crime family underwent a significant change in leadership in 1957. First a fruit shop in the Bronx is where Frank Scalise was tragically murdered in June. The family's head of household, Albert Anastasia, was then murdered in a Manhattan hotel barbershop in October. Gaji took measures and instructed his family to remain at home for a few days after Anastasia was killed. Aniello Della Croce a supporter of Anastasia, was made the underboss by Carlo Gambino, a close friend and colleague of Gaji, who now had authority over the family's Manhattan branch. Gaji's involvement in criminal activities deepened, and in October 1960, he carried out his first murder for the Gambino family. He was part of a hit squad responsible for killing Vincent Squilante, a mobster suspected of murdering Frank Scalise. Montilio, who was present during the murder, recounted Gaji's description, we surprised him, Squilante, in the Bronx. We shot him in the head, stuffed him in the trunk, then dumped him for good. The phrase dumped him for good meant that they brought the body to a building's basement, loaded it into a trash incinerator, and cremated it. After this brutal act, Gaji was formally initiated into the ranks of the Gambino crime family. Gaji had established himself in the world of organized crime by the middle of the 1960s. He had built up a sizable clientele as a loan shark and had made investments as a silent partner in several companies he was steadily gaining power and prominence in the criminal world. He joined forces with Roy DeMeo, a prominent gangster who ran a stolen automobile ring in the Brooklyn areas of Flatlands and Canarsie, in an effort to increase his income. DeMeo was well-connected to the Lucchese crime family and was known for being extremely skilled and inventive at making money. Gaggi was successful in persuading DeMeo to sever his ties with the Lucases and join the Gambino clan. Gaji and DeMeo started supplying their clients who were loan sharks with joint loans after collaborating. DeMeo was formally working for Gaji in 1970, paying tribute on a regular basis. They succeeded in coercing their way into a collaboration with a business engaged in the unauthorized processing of X-rated movies in 1972. 
but because of the interest this business initiative received from law enforcement, the corporation was raided in 1973. Gaji instructed DeMeo to get rid of Paul Rothenberg because he was the company's owner and he was working with the police, which would have negative consequences. The quick discovery of Rothenberg's body, which was lacerated by gunshot wounds, provided further evidence of the bloody and deadly underbelly of the criminal underworld. The murder of Paul Rothenberg marked the beginning of a series of violent killings committed by Roy DeMeo's crew. While Gaji wasn't directly involved in most of these murders, he did play a role in some of them. One such instance was the killing of Vincent Governara, an individual with no mob affiliations. The motive for this murder was a past altercation between Governara and Gaji, which had taken place 12 years before. In 1976, DeMeo executed George Biram, an electrical contractor, who had unwittingly tipped off thieves attempting to burglarize Gaji's vacation home in Florida, not realizing that Gaji and his wife were present at the time. Following Gaji's orders, DeMeo shot and killed Biram in a Miami hotel room. Gaji, along with another mobster named Tony Plate, then attempted to dismember the body. However, their gruesome task was interrupted by a construction crew outside the room, who were there to repair a faulty air conditioning unit, forcing them to flee the scene. The motel maid later discovered the bloody remains of George Biram. Carlo Gambino's passing in late 1976 sparked a succession conflict inside the Gambino crime family. Gambino had appointed Paul Castellano, his brother-in-law and head of the family's Brooklyn wing, to succeed him before he passed away. The Manhattan faction, meanwhile, was in support of their own boss and was led by Della Croce. After a meeting at Gaggi's home, it was decided that Castellano would take over as boss while Della Croce would continue to serve as underboss. Gaggi was instead made captain of Castellano's former group, despite his desire to go to underboss. Despite this, he continued to be close to Castellano and sought out higher positions. Gaggi urged that DeMeo join the Gambino clan, but at first Castellano was hesitant because of DeMeo's violent and unpredictable behavior. But Castellano gave in and welcomed DeMeo into the family throughout the course of the 1977 summer. The Westies, an Irish-American gang that controlled Hell's Kitchen, and the Gambino family later formed an alliance thanks to DeMeo. With Gaggi receiving a sizable percentage of the proceeds, DeMeo continued to grow his illegal enterprise. During this period, Gaggi also expanded his loan sharking business, receiving a substantial loan from Montilio, who was now a Gambino associate responsible for collecting payments from DeMeo and Gaggi's customers. Montilio's deep involvement in various aspects of Gaggi's criminal operations, particularly with the DeMeo crew, would later lead to severe consequences for Gaggi in the mid-1980s. In June 1978, Gaggi and nine other mobsters faced charges of racketeering, conspiracy, and fraud, following a year-long federal investigation into a theater's bankruptcy in New York. The evidence mainly came from wiretapped conversations, but fortunately for Gaggi, he had not said anything incriminating. In December 1978, he was cleared of all charges, managing to avoid prosecution successfully. By 1979, DeMeo's criminal enterprise had grown to encompass loan swindling, murder for hire, and running a car theft network that exported stolen vehicles to the Middle East. Gaggi reaped most of the rewards from these illegal ventures, while DeMeo's drug trafficking endeavors also netted him some cash. Large-scale sales of cocaine, marijuana, and different medications were actively promoted by the DeMeo crew. DeMeo continued his drug trade despite Castellano's public condemnation of drug trafficking. James Epolito, a captain in the Gambino family, informed Castellano about Gaggi and DeMeo's drug trafficking. Epolito claimed that DeMeo had cheated his son, who was a sold auto in the Gambino family, in a drug deal. Additionally, Epolito accused Gaggi of being an informant for the police. Epolito requested permission to murder Gaggi and DeMeo, but Castellano decided to support them instead. He granted Gaggi and DeMeo the green light to eliminate both Epolito and his son. On October 1, 1979, Gaggi and DeMeo carried out the killings of the Epolitos. However, a witness alerted an off-duty police officer, who encountered Gaggi walking away from the crime scene, DeMeo had already left. A brief shootout ensued, during which the police officer wounded Gaggi in the neck and apprehended him. Although Gaggi was charged with the murders and attempted murder of the police officer, he was ultimately convicted only of assault and sentenced to 5 to 15 years in federal prison. DeMeo gained control of Gaggi's group as acting captain while Gaggi was incarcerated. Gaggi was released from prison in 1981 after his conviction was reversed on appeal. His freedom was due to buying off a juror who had lied during the trial about government wrongdoing. After Gaggi's release from prison, 
Montilio became a drug addict and fled from New York to avoid potential repercussions from the Gambino family. The FBI took down DeMeo's auto theft ring, leading to the imprisonment of two crew members. In 1980 another crew member, Vito Arena, decided to cooperate with the government and became a witness. He started testifying about the crimes committed by Gaggi and the DeMeo crew. As the investigation intensified, Castellano became worried that DeMeo might cooperate with authorities if he were to be arrested. On January 20, 1983, DeMeo's body was discovered nearly frozen in the trunk of his car. Although the identity of DeMeo's killer remained unknown, law enforcement believed that Castellano might have ordered Gaggi or the remaining DeMeo crew members to carry out the murder. After DeMeo was killed, Montilio went back to New York to pay a previous loan sharking bill and was subsequently detained. Montilio made the decision to work with the government and share details about Gaggi and the DeMeo team in order to avoid prosecution. Gaggi and Castellano were both indicted as a result of his cooperation. Several members of the DeMeo crew were detained in the beginning of 1984. On February 4, 1984, one of the crew members, Richard De Nome, was killed. Although the identity of his killers was unknown, police believed the other DeMeo crew members were responsible. Richard De Nome's brother Frederick De Nome decided to testify before the government because he thought the DeMeo team was to blame for his brother's passing. In February, Gaggi was indicted on multiple charges, including racketeering and murder. The following month, Castellano was also indicted. Due to the numerous charges against both men, the court decided to conduct two separate trials. The first trial would address the auto theft ring and five related murders. It began in October 1985, featuring testimonies from Arena, De Nome, and Montilio. However, in December 1985, during the ongoing trial, Castellano was assassinated at the Sparks Steakhouse in Manhattan on orders from Capo John Gotti. With Castellano's death, Gaggi became the primary defendant in the first trial, and Gotti quickly took control of the Gambino family. In March 1986, Gaggi was convicted of conspiracy to sell stolen cars and received a five-year sentence in Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary. In 1988, he was transferred from Lewisburg to the Metropolitan Correction Center in preparation for his second trial. The second trial would focus on Gaggi's racketeering activities and the 25 murders allegedly committed by the DeMeo crew. Nino Gaggi suffered a heart attack on April 17, 1988, while awaiting his second trial. He had told a prison officer about his chest problems, but regrettably nothing was done right away. It was widely felt that Gaggi might have had a chance of surviving the heart attack if the jail staff had acted quickly and transported him to the hospital. His passing provoked a great deal of debate and prompted questions about the health of inmates in New York City. In response to the controversy and the allegations of negligence, Gaggi's wife pursued legal action against the prison system. With the support of testimonies from several other inmates, she successfully sued the prison system for negligence. The case shed light on the inadequate medical care provided to inmates and brought attention to the need for improved medical facilities and procedures within the New York City prison system. As a result of Gaggi's death and the subsequent legal actions, efforts were made to address the deficiencies in medical care in the city's prisons. The controversy surrounding his passing ultimately contributed to positive changes that aimed to provide better medical conditions and care for inmates in the future. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more character breakdowns and analysis of your favorite gangsters. See you in the next one.